Father, today we surrender our will, our wants, and our desires to you. We surrender, hearts abandoned, that we only live through you. Your kingdom be advanced in us. We give you praise and thanks for that today in the matchless name of Jesus. And amen, amen. Come on, let's give him the ovation of the morning. seated this morning. Praise the Lord. We're going to conclude our series on one life to live. How many know you only have one life to live? We need to live that life to the fullest. Amen. And the real life only begins in Jesus Christ. There is no life. You know, it's hard for people to understand because if uh, you were to just die physically in the natural, then people would understand that you only have one life to live. But as it was with Adam, God said that if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And he did die, but he didn't die naturally. It was a spiritual death. And so people, it is possible for people to live their whole life thinking that they're living and not living at all. Amen. But we today are going to talk about that one life and that experience. Uh, we said the other week, last Sunday, we had all kinds of no power and all that stuff. And so... The uh, technology wasn't too good, but I think we got it today, right? And so we're going to put that uh, vision statement up there for a moment, if we would. And let's just say that together again before we get started. And uh, see, we have that. Oh, yeah, see, they're on it. Let's say that aspires to encounter God, equip believers empower followers and engage our culture with love say it one more time one life church aspires to encounter god equip believers empower followers and engage our culture with love amen that's the reason we're here that's the reason we're here one life church Today, uh, next Sunday, uh, we will be having, uh, you can learn more about the church, you can learn more about yourself, you can also meet some awesome people in Next Steps, where that you will learn more about the church, yourself, and other people, and you will be able to uh, connect with what is going on in the vision here, and that is called our Next Steps, and that uh, takes place immediately following the worship service. Connected or learn more during that time next Sunday. I want to look today at engaging our culture. Today, it seems like that in the culture, I, I talked some about it last week, but we uh, are, have been pressed to just be a subculture instead of being a counterculture. Being a subculture, just in a different place. So we're no different than the Moose Lodge. We're no different than other organizations. We just do it in a different place. But whenever we understand that we are not a subculture, we are a counterculture, then we uh, do not give in to the culture of the day. We create culture. Amen. And it is a different culture. And so uh, we are, that's where we are today. And we are going to encounter Amen. God, we're going to equip the believer. We're going to empower the follower so that we can engage our culture with love. Amen. Praise God. And that doesn't mean out here with a bunch of signs and marching around, we don't do stupid stuff. 
Amen. If there were more people that would pray in secret, God would reward us openly. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so what we have to understand is, is the things of marching and all of that, I guess it's all right. People need, but the reality is it, it isn't won. As I said Wednesday night, Jesus didn't win the battle on the cross. He won the battle in the garden. It's in the private places of your life that results are taking place, but it's shown in public places. And so today we're going to talk about engaging our culture. And I want to look at Genesis chapter number one and verse number three, because this thing started in the beginning. Genesis one and three at creation, the first words out of God's mouth were this, let there be light. Let there be light. Have you ever wondered why that the first thing that he did was create light? I believe it's because without light, there is no life. Light is responsible for all life. In other words, Christ is life revealed according to the light. In the beginning, had God not created the light, there would have been no purpose for anything else. Without light, there is no life. Amen. We do not and cannot exist without light. In the earth, there are days that we don't have light. It is dark, but things don't continue, but things continue to live. But if light disappeared... Amen. From, from the earth permanently, life, including the existence of man, would disappear from the earth permanently because everything would die if there was no light. All creation is subject and dependent upon the light. We are nothing without light. We can do nothing without light. And this is why the first words out of God's mouth were in the very beginning, let there be light. In essence, he was saying, let there be life. Because if there is no light, there is no life. Amen. John chapter 8 and verse 12, he speaks, Jesus said unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. And he that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am life. Without Christ, without the light, you cannot live. Of course, our physical man would continue to live, but remember, all men are creations of God. Therefore, we are spiritual beings. There is no life spiritually without the light and the life of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Every physical man is dependent upon physical DNA, just as the spiritual man is identified by spiritual DNA. And what the spiritual DNA, it is to be born again. Amen. There is, we receive DNA from the Son of God, and we are spiritually born again. Amen. Nicodemus came to Jesus by, come on, Bible scholars. G Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because there was no light in him. But he came to the light. Come on, follow me now. Man, and, and the light began to shine in the darkness. And, and Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? And he said, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit of God. And so the life change comes whenever we accept the light or Jesus Christ into our life. In John chapter 1 and verse 5, he said the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. At creation, the earth was dark. It was void. It was chaotic. 
darkness covered the face of the deep and the earth was the enemy's playground. It was Lucifer's playground. The devil was running rampant, but then all of a sudden something happened. Light shined into the darkness and the darkness could not comprehend the light. It could not, in other words, it could not overcome the light. Darkness could not resist the light. Amen. And the, the complete and total darkness upon the face of the earth, it was real. It was powerful. It was intimidating. It was an intimidating force. It was a frightening and heavy thing to be in the midst of darkness. Have you ever been in complete darkness? All right, two of you. Well, two, complete darkness can be intimidating. It can be something that's very heavy. But let me tell you something that, that you know, uh, whenever I'm not talking about just having a few street lights on or I'm not talking about having a night light on, I'm talking about being in the middle of darkness. And whenever I was growing up, Dad and I, we would go coon hunting. And uh, in, around here, we don't know too much about it, but in Ohio, they had swamps. And those coon would go through the swamps. And the stupid dogs would follow them. And there were times whenever Dad would tell me, he, sometimes he'd carry me, believe it or not. I ain't always been this big. Sometimes he would carry me, but sometimes if the swamp was real deep and, and real messy, he would just tell me, he'd say, sit here and I'll be back. That was easy for him to say. He had the light and the gun. And in the middle of complete darkness, your mind begins to imagine all kinds of things. There was wampus cats in them trees. There was all kinds of things that would go on in the midst of complete darkness, right? But as I could see the light begin to come back and begin to come toward me, then strength would come back to me. My legs would quit knocking. And, and I would get up and clean myself off and I would be prepared for his return because the light got closer and the closer the light got, the more strength I got because darkness could not have that hold on me any longer. Now I know some of you aren't scared of the dark. I'm not a scared of the dark either. I was just afraid of what was in that dark. Amen. But let there be light. In the midst of that darkness, that heaviness and thickness, when God said, let there be light, without resistance, without a struggle, darkness fleed. Amen. There is, was no fight, for darkness had no choice. It had to go. And today, nothing has changed. When you, we say, let there be light, darkness has to go. In all of history, there's never been one time when darkness has overcome light. Light has been the power of the revelation of who God is. It is the revelation of life. It is the, that power that causes darkness to dissipate. So darkness has no place in the life of the believer. It has no place. Sickness has no place. Death has no place. Bondage has no place place so darkness has no place in the life of the believer we are sons and daughters of light amen so as sons of daughters of light then sickness and bondage have no place in our lives so you ask me what does this have to do with me and what does it have to do with the vision I'm glad you asked Genesis 1 and 16 said, God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. The sun, of course, is the greater light. It is the light of the day. The moon is the lesser light. In fact, it has no light of its own. It's merely a reflection of the sun. The moon has no light of its own. It's merely a reflection of the sun. 
But God made two lights. He made the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. You say, well, that is good too. But what does that mean? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 says this. You say, that's me. Say, that's me. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Nor does the light, uh, do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Ever since the beginning of time, we see that God gave his plan for us to engage our culture. Because you see, not only did he give a son for the natural, but he gave a, his son to us. He gave the sun to rule the day, the light, and the sun represents the son, Jesus Christ, and he is the light of the world. I'll try that again in this Presbyterian church. I said, Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And he cannot be hid. There's a lot of people that have tried to put him out. There's a lot of systems that have tried to put him out. But no matter how they try, they cannot do away with the light of the world. Amen. Herod tried to kill him. Amen. We see that they tried to kill him ever since he was a child because there was something different about this boy. He, he wasn't normal. He was, he was in the natural, but he was supernatural. And there was a light everywhere he he went he he walked into the temple among the scholars and opened up the book and found himself in the book and said the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted and set at liberty them that are bruised and after he read it he shut the book amen and walked away I want to tell you that ever since he came into the earth he's made a difference glory to God he walked up Galilee got this heel he threw out his arms and he died on a cross and he died till the sun refused to shine he died until the centurion repented he died until law turned to grace amen but on the third resurrection morning he said oh death where is your victory and oh grave where is your sting amen why because he said I am alive and alive forevermore the light cannot be put out out. If he's been light in your life, give him some kind of praise today. I'm thankful for the light of the world. Amen. Buddha is not the light. ISIS is not the light. <laughs> Krishna is not the light. Jesus is the light. Of the world amen he is the ultimate light but then that gives us he is the greater light but then that leads us to say then what is the lesser light the moon is the lesser light that is faithful to reflect the light of the Sun in darkness and that's where we come in we are not the greater light but we are the lesser light that is faithful to reflect the greater light in the midst of the night and the reality of it is this even though we're not the greater light we're the lesser light but we still have enough light to light up the night I'll just clap for myself amen because you see the reality of it is this we are not God but we are a reflection of God. We're born son of, uh, we're born bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Amen. We are to reflect the light 
of glory. We are to reflect the light of Father God. We are to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that light that shines through us is enough to light up the night. Amen. Light up the night in your workplace. Light be a light in the school light the night in the marketplace shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the father which is in heaven amen I'm telling you today that it is our responsibility to engage our culture our world with love light the night how many know that it's a dark day it's a dark time. I know that, that for us, we haven't lived long enough, but there, are, there have, in history, there have been darker days. But this is particularly in the hour in which we live. We're living in the, one of the darkest days that we have known in some time. In this culture that we live in, people are lost in the darkness. It isn't that people, I don't, I, I'm just pastoring here this morning it isn't that people are are just being rebellious they just don't know right from wrong the lines have become so blurred that generations don't know good from evil they don't know the things that we used to know in culture and understand that it's, there, there are some things that are wrong. They just, they've been brought up in this culture and so they have accepted it as being normal. But how many know there's some things in our culture that are not normal? And we have to be a light in the night. We have to engage this culture with love and let them know. You see, there was a time whenever uh, Christians could bring conviction upon those who had, had, were, weren't accepted Christ just by being in their presence. It wasn't they condemned them. It wasn't that they talked down to them, but people would get antsy around them. That's the reason why folks wouldn't talk to you at family reunions. It's the reason why that people didn't uh, all the time want to come up over to your house because, because the conviction of being the light in the darkness would begin to convict them that they had darkness in their life and they needed the light. Amen. But you see, today we, we have become this subculture instead of the counterculture. And we have, re, we have stopped reflecting the light in the dike. And we have just learned how to just be a part of it. Amen. But I want to tell you today that I'm not going to cohabitate with the devil. I'm not going to live in a duplex with demons. I am going to stand up and declare the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to say that even in this dark hour, amen, in, in the darkness that has overcome America, that there is still a people, there is still a God, and there is still a light in the midst of the night. We're not the light, but we're a lesser light, but we're still a light that can light the night. We've just got to turn our light on. We've just got to tell folks wherever we are. We, if you're waiting for folks to come to Christ at church, that's wonderful. We thank God for folks that come. But every day of your life, you need to turn on your light. The American Express card said, don't leave home without it. I submit to you, don't leave home without your light. If you don't have a light, stay home until you get a light. Pray through. Ask God, God, help me to reflect the light today because there's people in my workplace that need to see the light. There's people around me that need the hope. There's people in my life and in my family that the light needs to come on. Help me to be the light and encounter them with love so that they can see the hope of glory. How many know this culture is struggling with hope? A hopeless culture that we are living in and who's going to tell them there is hope amen oh bud ain't gonna do it for you bud ain't gonna make you wiser <laughs> don't believe that lie amen and we ain't even talking about bud the light 
Does all that do is confuse you and you'll wake up in the morning with the same problems. Come on, somebody. It's quiet up in this house today. Amen. But there is a light that when you turn on that light, it'll cause the darkness to run out of your life. And we need to turn that light on to our community. We need to turn that light on in our school. And we don't have to just do it on Sunday that we should get the, the, the mantle and everything that we need prepared here on Sunday. But then we go into our culture and we don't shut our mouth. We don't remain silent. We don't refuse to shine. We be like, we'll be like a mirror. And we say, God, whatever it is in you, let it reflect off of me and go into somebody else so they can find the hope of glory. Amen. And you see, in this culture that we're living in, people are lost in the dark. But I refuse to just be a subculture. Amen. See, we, we're, I told you the other day, this political correctness is a disease that is destroying America. I've got a Greek word for it, baloney. Amen. They tried to they uh, they tried to intimidate the church. Oh, you can't say nothing. Well, bring it on. Well, there's a separation of church and state. Yes, there is. So you keep your state out of our church. Amen. I was in a meeting of leadership the other day and they said, well, let's, let, we need to pray, pray who to vote for in this upcoming election. And I, I listened to it for about 10 minutes and I said, this is the stupidest conversation I've had been a part of in a long time. I said, there ain't nothing to be praying about who to vote for. And I know it may even upset some of you today, but hey, get, get, in the, get out of the dark and get in the light. Amen. I said, there ain't no, I, I said, I refuse to ever vote for a person who thinks it's all right to kill babies. Yeah. You'll never get my vote. I said, you'll never get my vote. They said, well, you can't tell people who to vote for. Everybody else does, so why can't I? Amen. You're going to try to stranglehold the church? No, the devil is a liar. That's the reason this political correctness has got us in the mess. It's time for the church to be the light. I said it's time for the church to be the light. Amen. And we've got to shine this light in the midst of darkness so that the world can see the love of Jesus Christ. We've got to engage this culture. We're the light that shines in darkness. Amen. We engage the culture in a couple of different ways. One of them is through benevolence. And I want to, want to help you understand, if you don't already, kind of my way of thinking. And benevolence is it help, it's that how we help people in need. It is um, folks that need food, somebody that needs clothing. We, uh, we expect nothing in return. We give it with cheerful hearts. We give it with joy. We help people as we can help them. We bless them as we can bless them. And, and, but we have uh, joined. How many know whenever you join your resources together, you can do more? And so we've joined our resources together with 14 other churches in this town to accomplish feeding the hungry and being able to provide for those who are in need so that we can be able to make an impact. Someone told me when we made this decision, they said, well, folks won't, won't know that it come for us. And I said, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is we, we feed the hungry, we meet a need, and, and it's about the kingdom. So it doesn't matter if somebody knows that it came from one life or it came somewhere else. No, we're just here to minister to people. Amen? And so benevolence is feeding, it is clothing, it is something that we do without expectation. Now, <clears throat> the difference between benevolence and outreach is this. We, in outreach, we show our community the love of Christ through big events. They're all free, amen? But we do this 
for one purpose, and that is uh, to see their lives changed. We expect something from our outreach. We expect as we invest our time, our talent, our energy, our treasures into outreach like the big events that we have. It gives us opportunity to invite friends and family in so they can hear the gospel, see the light, and their life be changed. Amen. And so that's what our outreach is. Our student ministry is doing outreach. They're having prayer walks on Saturday morning, going around and praying and walking around our community. And we thank God that they've caught the vision and doing that with great joy. Amen. And, and, and they're praying and believing God for our region to be saved. On one of the ongoing outreaches that we have is our book, Hope Rising. Amen. And I think that uh, we've got uh, some pictures. I don't know if you can see them or not. Do we have the pictures of uh, the graphics where the books have been distributed? There we go. Now, I know you can't make a whole lot out of this, but this is where your resources have gone. We have sent these books, Hope Rising Out, and, and there's been a total, let me get the total, there's a total of 1,850 homes that have received these books, Hope Rising, since December. Since December, 1,850 homes. Now, how many homes is, how many people are in those homes? We do not know. But we know that 1,850 people in this region, in this community so far, because of your help and your faithfulness in your giving, they have received a book of testimonies of people's lives that have been changed. Amen. There, we have received testimonies of some people. And uh, one individual sent me a picture the other day of the book Hope Rising and in the background you could see One Life Church and I will not read it all but I will she, they shared their testimony or their life story with me and then they added this it said sometimes the people that need us the most are literally in our backyard and they thanked us for giving them the free book. They said we literally cried all the way through the book. They had they had, had an experience with God and they had turned away from the Lord and, and, and needed to renew that relationship. And they said we literally cried all the way through the book and remembered who God is and what he can do in our lives. You see, sometimes things go unnoticed and, and sometimes it may seem like that it's even unappreciated. But the reality of it is this, that everything we do is to engage our culture with love. But it's not just something we do on Sundays. We have to take what we get here and we've got to take it into darkness. We've got to be mirror reflecting what the word of God comes what his what his presence is how we experience God in our lives on Sunday we've got to reflect that in the marketplace we've got to reflect that in the workplace we've got to reflect that wherever we go and so today I just want to say to you that that we are fulfilling the vision but we haven't completed the vision I said, we're fulfilling the vision, but we're not completed the vision. There is still so much to do. There are still so many lives to be changed. There are so many people that have to be reached. There is so much darkness that our light needs to shine forth in that darkness so that people can see the love of Jesus because there's a lot of folks that really believe that they have done so much wrong or they have done this or they have done that or their life has been so chaotic that there's no way that Jesus can love them. But listen to me, if Jesus can love Barabbas, amen, you know who Barabbas is. If Jesus can love Barabbas, then he can love you. 
No matter what has gone on in your life, no matter the circumstances of life, no matter what has taken place in your life, if you will allow that light to shine into your life, the darkness will have to go and the light of glory will be revealed in your life. Amen. And I'm so thankful today that God would allow us to be have a part. Amen. And I just want to be faithful in what he has for us to do. And we aren't just haphazardly walking through life. We're not just here on a whim. We're not just here swinging from one limb to another. We are here on purpose. For such a time as this, God has brought us into this place. And we're doing life. We're doing life on purpose. We've got a purpose. We've got a mission that we are going to complete. And that is we are going to light up the night. Amen. I said, we're going to light up the night. And we're going to let people know that, that, that there is a loving father. That there is a gracious God. And that he really does care for each and every one of us. Amen. And until you've known that love, until you've known that grace, until you've known his mercy, then you have never lived. It doesn't matter if you're 10 or 110. If you don't know the love of the Father, if you don't know the light of his goodness and his grace, then you have never yet begun to live. But when we see the light and we become the light, then it doesn't just help us, but it helps others because we are the light of the world. We don't have a problem saying Jesus is the light of the world. Where we have our problem is saying that I am the light of the world. And the reason is what the, of that is because we don't want to take that responsibility. But with this great joy of knowing Christ and living a life of freedom comes the responsibility that we become the light of the world because somebody else shined the light on our path so that we could find our way to Calvary's cross. Then we turn around and we become that light so that others can find the cross and that their lives can be changed. And so it isn't just an honor, but with the honor becomes a responsibility that we are the light. My question is today, have you been the light? Amen. I understand, and, and as I've told you before, we, you can't preach total uh, truth in one message, so you'll have to just keep on coming back to hear my whole heart. But listen to me. You aren't going to live the world, win the world, acting like the world. And I don't believe you have to look like the world to win the world. All you have to have is light. And light, <laughs> light draws. I said light draws. Light draws out of darkness. It draws people to light. And I'm here today to tell you that we don't have, yes, we're going to do all we can to reach people. Yes, we're going to be as current as we possibly can and relevant to the culture. But we're not going to become a subculture. We're going to be a counterculture and we're going to be that light that will shine in the darkest of the night and allow people to know that there is a God that loves them so much that he gave his son that they could have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. We're going to live life on purpose. And we're going to tell G everyone that we meet, Jesus can change your life too. Amen. Jesus can change your life too. We weren't all of that in a bag of chips and some government cheese. Huh? We ain't always look this good, <laughs> but thank God for the light. Come on, somebody. Thank God for the light. Praise God that shined into our life and made the difference. Today, I want to give you opportunity in that ongoing ministry, ongoing outreach. I know that many of you have already done it and your faithfulness is the reason why that we've reached 1,850 homes. 
I'll get just took time today, but we have some other testimonies of people's lives that have been changed. We've I've seen people in the store and they've thanked us for the book and said that it, that they changed their life. In fact, one person even it, it so impacted them that they found out how they took it on themselves to find out how that they could be one to support it. Amen. And they started because they said, this has so changed my life and so impactful to me that I wanted to help somebody else. And so they took it on themselves to, they didn't come through us. They went, uh, did it through the, the book publisher so that they could be a part of changing other people's lives. Just one book. Received a testimony from another person. They said, that I know that the note says in the back that after we've read this book that we're to give it to somebody else. But they said, if you don't mind, I would like to keep on hold of it for a while and reread it again. I don't know how this book will affect people's lives eternity will know but I'm not in it to build a palace I'm in it to build his kingdom and if we can hear him say well done who knows because we don't keep count and record but God does one day when we get to heaven he could say look the investment that you made you see that one over there you see that one over there you see that one coming they're here because you made an investment you were light in the night you shine forth in the midst of darkness and because of that their lives are changed so today we're not making a big push, but we do have the cards there available for you. If you haven't been a part of that, would like to be a part of that, all of the information you need to fill out is right there. And you can be a part of lighting the night in our region. Because we're going to keep on pushing it and we're going to keep on doing it. Amen. Until we reach this community and this region with every home having an opportunity to have the darkness dissipated and the light of his glory revealed in their lives. Amen.